Hello, I'm Doug Shear, and I'm happy to welcome you to the Birdcliff Forum, a project of Woodstock Birdcliff Guild in Woodstock, New York. This Zoom event is our first Woodstock Masters Dialogue, featuring artist Mary Frank, and is being conducted on Monday, July 20th, 2020, at 5 p.m. She will be interviewed by artist David Hornung. The comments made by the speakers reflect their opinions and thoughts and are not necessarily those of Birdcliff Forum, the Woodstock Birdcliff Guild, its staff, or volunteers. This event includes the play of a 20-minute video of Mary in her garden and studio immediately following the introductions. After that, the interview begins. The event is being recorded and will be archived and will soon be on both the Birdcliff website and the Birdcliff YouTube channel. David Hornung is a painter and collage artist whose work has been widely exhibited in the US and the UK. He is the author of Color, a workshop for artists and, and designers from the Lawrence King Publications Limited, a textbook that has been published in six languages and is used in art schools and many private studios worldwide. David has held teaching positions at Indiana University, Skidmore College, and the Rhode Island School of Design. He is currently a professor of art at Adelphi University. He is represented by Elena Zang Gallery in Woodstock. David. Hello, Doug. Um, I'll say a few words about Mary. Mary Frank was born in London, England in 1933. She moved to the United States with her family in 1940. In the 50s, she studied with Hans Hoffmann and Max Beckmann. She worked across discipline as a sculptor, painter, photographer, and gifted ceramic artist. She has been the subject of numerous museum exhibitions, including a retrospective at the Neuberger Museum uh, in Purchase, New York. Her work is in the collection of major museums such as the Art Institute of Chicago, the Hirshhorn Museum, the Jewish Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Museum of Modern Art. Books on her work include Mary Frank by Haydn Herrera, Mary Frank Encounters by Linda Nochlin, Experiences by Mary Frank, and Pilgrimage, photographs by Mary Frank, among others. Mary lives and works in New York City in Woodstock, New York. She is represented by D.C. Moore in New York City and Elena Zang Gallery in Woodstock, New York. I'm in my studio. We fled, as many people who are fortunate enough to have a place to fled to uh, in March, and not, of course, snowing, as we didn't know. Um, so it is extraordinary, of course, to be able to be here. And otherwise we live half the year in the city and half the year here. Um, I am, just before, quite recently bef before we left, um, I work with a group called We Make America. It's women artists and I've done posters from way before. Uh, Vietnam, but uh, there all these women got together, mainly in Joyce Kozlov's studio, sometimes in mine, and uh, and I just got an email that now they're painting on uh, the boards where buildings are boarded up in the city. The names, Black Lives Matter, Social Justice, and I am very struck by all the imagery that I see mostly online, because I can't go to the demonstrations now. Uh, the phenomena that all over the world, I didn't think that I would live to see the kind of uprising, courage, passion, and imagery, amazing imagery done by some artists, but mainly just by people, many of whom probably never made a poster or anything before in their lives. And I would be very proud to have made many of the ones I see. And it, it, it flows into a, a, a big subject for me, which is what is art for? 
And I have a list which keeps on changing, written on leaves. It's to recognize ourselves as part of humanity, as part of this planet, our abilities, efforts to try to keep what is alive, whatever form, not only people and mammals, but the earth itself. And uh, I have no idea that if art can do that, but historically, imagery had always a lot of power. I think in, in Russia at one point, when I forget who was attacking St. Petersburg, they went out with the icon of the Virgin and held it up to the enemy. And unfortunately, maybe the painting wasn't good enough, whatever, it didn't work. They were attacked anyhow. But just the idea of holding up an image to affect change, right? So, uh, yeah. And um, so I, all the work here, the only piece I brought up that was finished, and I'd done this just after I, I just had a show. I was so lucky to have the last show, really, at D.C. Moore in the city uh, uh, before, before everything closed. And I'm using stones in the face because I'm painting so much on stones since a number of years. And the stones are what we walk and live on in the Catskill, bluestone. And I'd forgotten that <laughs> I'd painted it on a board that was the program that my husband, Leo Treitler, and the wonderful soprano, Lily Arbusser, this is from years ago, because they do house concerts here. And we wanted to have one, of course, this summer. And I don't think it's possible because you can't drag the piano outside. But music is huge, I think, for everybody in whatever form. But it has an enormous effect for me. These are both old posters. I did this one. Uh, I wasn't invited to. It was my idea to do something for Human Rights Watch. It was the 10th anniversary, so that's a long time ago. And this sculpture is very small. It looks huge. And this one was uh, for before the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. And it says, save life from nu nuclear disaster. Well, here you can see some of the stones. Actually, this is paper, not a stone, but I painted it so many times it's almost become like a stone. And um, I make these and then I, I use them in, in photographs. Uh, and there's a book of, uh, the most recent book is, is photography. It's called Pilgrimage, and I can show you that. But. Uh, the stones then move around, sort of on their own, with some help from me. And uh, they could then become part of, for instance, something else. Or this painting, which is in process, maybe tomorrow or next week it will look very different. But in my mind, I wish it could actually be part of the painting on the floor. And then the painting on the floor, of course, changes all the time, depending on who, who's in the ship. And I have done a lot of work of um, imagery of migrants, immigration, since that's what's going on, although I don't know right now if it can at all. This one, I'll just tell you a story. I was in Morocco once, um, years ago. And um, it's the only time and place ever in my life where I've been where you're not to draw. I was told, do not draw, because I always draw everywhere and work on papers, huge part of my life. I think there's 60 drawers in New York and 40 up here. And then there are other places. But 
so that was very strange. And uh, I was in the desert, but there was a creek, a wadi, and I just went alone, and there was nobody there, so I started to draw a bit. And all of a sudden, uh, like a tribe of little girls, maybe, you know, teenage, younger. Uh, they came and they sort of attacked me, I think because I was drawing. Also, they wanted my earrings, my jeans, my me. And it was sort of scary. They were quite aggressive. And all I could think to do was, uh, I wasn't crying, but I pretended to. And they stopped. But the only thing I bought, one thing in Morocco, was a photograph that I found on the street. And the photograph, this is pre-internet, pre all the possibilities, what you can do with a photograph, of an image, something like this, a fish with human legs in f on a beach in front of huge waves coming. And underneath, written in French, um, uh, uh, Palancet, uh, on a trouvé une vraie sirène, they found a real siren. And I was so stunned by it, the, just the whole idea of being in this place where I hadn't seen any imagery, not advertising, not anything. It was uh, a lot to learn. Yes. Now, there are a number of books on, on my work, different aspects, and they, some of them were wonderful collaborations for me, and I love collaborations, whether with theater, with poets, with books. Uh, this was the what I did with Peter Matheson, the great naturalist and wonderful friend. And it's his writing from over 50 years of traveling enormously in Africa and referring to the decimation, this is from years ago already, uh, of, of wildlife in, in Africa. And they did a beautiful job, I think Abrams, and it's out of print, but people do get my books out of print. This one was uh, from a show that had many of the triptychs. So that would be paintings. There's the clay piece that you saw outside in bronze. Oh, let me just find the This is the outside of the painting, four by four, and then this opens, this opens, and this is the inside. And so this book was the catalog of a show with many triptychs. So the whole point was that people could open them, but the day before when we were putting the show up, the director said, well, we can't have people touch them. I said, what do you mean they can't touch them? She said, oh, it's, you know, insurance. Da, da, da. I said, well, then I can't have a show because how could you have a triptych if you can't open, open it up? I said, they're not coming in with chocolate ice cream on their hands, and my hands are much dirtier than theirs anyhow. And so we did. And it was wonderful. People were opening, so they were saying, seeing, you know, half, this half, different ones. So it had a kind of theater quality because they were sort of almost inside the triptychs. Then um, I did a book with Jonathan Cott on the poetry of Emily Dickinson. And uh, actually Jackie Onassis was the editor, but she, she died bef before it came out. But it's a small book with what I call shadow papers, which are, yeah. This is the most. This is the most recent book, which is from 62 images from the show I had at DC Moore of photographs and beautiful writing at the back with my great friend Terry Tempest Williams, the activist, wonderful writer. Her latest book is Erosion. Then Hayden Herrera did a big monograph just called Mary Frank, which was sculpture paintings, drawings. The mushroom fungi is like this on the tree, and when you can draw on it, and you're not drawing, you're actually scratching in with my fingernail or anything sharp. 
So there's no ink or color here. What you're seeing is the oxidized mushroom, which turns this great brown or ochre. And they last forever. And I have some not here in New York that are that big. So it's a matter of just finding them at the right moment when you can scratch in. I've shown with the very wonderful gallery, uh, Elena Zhang and Alan Hoffman uh, in Woodstock, which has the greatest vegetable garden and flowers. And people get to browse in the garden beside the gallery. And um, after one show I had there, I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I just started painting on the floor. And, uh, and then I started putting things down on the paintings. Uh, I didn't know what I was really doing or going to do. Uh, I put flowers sometimes, or little older sculptures. And, um, and then, because I couldn't just leave them all on the floor and work, All the sculptures here, I think, were all clay, and then some have been cast in bronze. So this one was never cast, and I don't intend to. And actually, I started with the head. In this case, I actually remember. And I, I was only interested in making a head. I had a big kill in the city, uh, but not this big, of course. And. Um, and then I realized I just wanted to continue, continue the body. And uh, it gave me the possibility to change things. I mean, maybe I made six of the arms, right? And, uh, and I could move them around and have air, water, plants, whatever, be part of the, the creature body. This, of course, was also clay. And I do like it. Birds sit on them a lot, and then they look very good. And of course, they change with time, like the rest of us. So the patinas, whatever they are, change. This one, if you're close, and this is very good sunlight on it, there are uh, stamps that I make in clay. Uh, they're my Mesopotamian stamps, which is sort of the first printing, not usually referred to as that, right? For thousands of years, they made things in reverse, negative, stamped it into clay or wax. And so for me, these are then the horse, hands, figures, the sort of what's going on maybe in her head. And she's been here for many years. Uh, it's a Persephone figure. I had a show at the Brooklyn Museum with the, I think it was the clay piece then, and um, 80 monoprints drawings work on paper, all on the same, same, same theme. We, I and my husband, Leo Treitler, were visiting Jean-Louis Bourgeois over 25 years ago. He was living off the grid completely. That's Louis Bourgeois's son. And he had written something about my work, you know, years ago. And he uh, talked about solar cookers. I'd never heard of it. It was very tiny then. There were only a few designs. Uh, one that you could make yourself, and you can still make yourself very easily. And now there are hundreds. And uh, solar cooking, free, no emission, energy for cooking and making water safe, cooking everything. And billions of people all over the world are still cooking with wood if they can find it, no more forest. I've seen a picture of a man scraping from a huge miles of garbage heap, scraping, putting a match to it to cook. So on top of all the other horrors with the corona, 
all the women girls who start when they're 12, 13, usually cooking all over the world, uh, their lungs are already half destroyed. So they're way up there for, for corona. This is a fancier one. And it's not hot yet because the sun isn't high enough. It goes up to 300, 350. And last night I had uh, rice and mushrooms and almonds and cashews and zucchini that somebody brought me and um, onions and I forget what else. It was pretty good. Uh, fish is phenomenal. And uh, most Americans ask when I talk about it, how long does it take? And I say, well, chicken mostly about two hours, fish an hour, beans, of course, more. And French people say, est-ce que c'est délicieux? Is it delicious? <laughs> and it is very delicious. And nothing gets dried out. So here, and you always cook in a black pot, holds the heat. And very interesting thing for me to do is to ask people what's free in the world. And they mostly don't say the sun. Not because they're stupid. It's because we just take it for granted. So this... And I can leave it out even if it rains, doesn't rain inside. I've done a lot of demonstrations. We, di we did a demonstration at the UN on the sidewalk. We had uh, 16 of the very simple cookers out made with cardboard. We had people touch the pot through the plastic bag that the pot is in, just when it was getting hot, not really. But the woman from Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, she left her finger a tiny bit too long. There were, we thought there'd be 80 people, there were almost 200, so they all got very tiny tastes. But when she touched it, and then she said, oh, je suis brûlée. And I went over and said, oh, you know, you left your finger. It's not really bad. And she said, she put her arms around me, and tears streaming down. She said it was the best burn she ever had. In Norway, a restaurant in the summer runs all solar. There are restaurants in France, there are people cooking on beaches all over the world. Um, but millions and millions of people have them, and the costs vary, big vari variation. Uh, the cheapest one to buy, which is the same one you can make for nothing, is $50. Pretty good. And uh, that's cardboard, folds up, could be shipped all over the world, weighs a pound. And it's a big effect on climate change, no pollution. And no rape of women who now, they did go, here's the village, two miles, three miles, five miles, ten, now they go 20 miles, and they're cutting green saplings, and uh, they sleep out because they can't get home, and men know they're sleeping out, and, and it's very common. They're raped with the daughters, yeah. So there's quite a few reasons. Yeah. Um, I, one of the things I wanted to talk about uh, was your use of multiple materials and textures in a piece. And I think this is a really good one uh, because you're, you're actually putting stone on the panel. And I, want, I want to ask you, about how this works for you. I mean, it's, you're actually creating a more sculptural reality on a flat panel. What are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, this is <clears throat> an old painting, which I liked aspects of, but I never felt, you know, really happy or, you know, totally interested in it. And so uh, the three small panels were on top and there was the figure there and uh, the hands were different. And I believe she was holding a, a boat, a ship, which for me is always immigrants, migration. And, uh, but the, I never, the face was all terrible. And so I redid a lot of it. 
mainly the face. And I was able to, since I'm using stone so much, I wanted to use stones in the face. And what, what it became then was that when you would shift a little bit to the left or the right, of course, because it's so three-dimensional, then the expression changes, which mm -hmm. I didn't realize how much it would do and which, which I wanted because that's, that's how I am. That's how we are. Expressions are changing due yeah, to uh, just being alive and the world now, right now. Yeah. I think it's interesting because um, actually, if we go to the second image, which is a detail of this, uh, and it's shot a little bit from the side where you can yeah. actually see the relief uh, on the head, particularly. Um, it's interesting because you began, or at least the first work of yours that got recognized um, was sculpture, mostly. I mean, carved wood and, and terracotta, clay. And it's interesting that you're kind of working, in a way you're working back in this piece, at least, and some of the more recent pieces, toward a more sculptural conception, I think. Yeah, it isn't uh, something that I made a decision, that's what I want to do. That is what seems to happen more and more, that I like the combination of the tactile, the three-dimensionality, and the flat. And sometimes I also use photographs, photographs of mine, which could include photographs of, of my own sculpture or other things mm -hmm. in, in a painting, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because in a way, if you think about the image on a painting is a fictional part and the materials are the factual part. Mm -hmm. And true. in a way, I think you're really pronouncing this duality of fact and fiction when you work with such, with such extremes of uh, physical material. Um, another thing, can we go back to the first one, please? Yeah, uh, another thing you brought up was this idea of having a piece lying around for a lot of, even years, and then working back into it. Would you say that's kind of typical of your work procedure? Um, well, it certainly happens. I don't know, typical. I mean, I dream of making a painting in one day, but I've only done that once or twice. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course I did a lot of very small sculptures very quickly, but uh, no, time, I don't know. We're ambushed by time now. Time in order to try to save this country. Uh, just our own time lives and our relationship to the past. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in a way, a painting, um, until at least your studio, is still a living organism. Right? I hope it is. I hope that would be that would be uh, a, a wish fulfilled, a rather big one, because mm -hmm. to me, the whole phenomena of of work, what is work for? and what are we for? And uh, the desire is that uh, images imprint, they come from inside somewhere and then dealing with different materials, stuff itself, raw, the raw materials. But hopefully then the images uh, can possibly be imprinted for other people as so much work that I've seen from way the past and present is imprinted in me and lives in me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can we go to the third image, please? Here we go. So this painting titled, Or Was It Like This? Uh, shows what I would describe as a vortex. And one of the reasons I picked this piece and the next piece to discuss is something that I think is very prevalent in a lot of your work, which is a state of movement. And thinking back on, um, I mean, movement in a kind of cosmic sense, I mean, obviously, but also the way you depict the figure, often very extended and in a state of, of entropy. Um, I was thinking about the, um, the idea that you were once a dancer. I know that you um, downplay that, but you did study with Martha Graham, right? Right. I don't downplay that I studied. I downplay that I danced. I never danced professionally. And sometimes that gets mixed up. Not the same. But I studied. That's what I really wanted to do. And I studied some with, with Hanya Holm 
and took some Indian classes, but mainly Graham. And I, I worked very hard and it had tremendous um, influence, input mm -hmm. on me, it, for me. Yeah. Do you see it as, I mean, it seems to me that that's really infiltrated your visual art. Um, I think so. Throughout. Yeah. Well, dance is the body in space and that's what we are, like it or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the, the combination of imagery here with the, the sort of human uh, figure, but also sort of mythical figures. Um, another aspect of your work is this almost atavistic quality, this, you know, almost going back to the caves. In fact, I, I often feel that your work is redolent of um, almost like a combination of William Blake and the, the, the caverns in France. Does that wow, make sense? That's a, that's a nice combination. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Do you see Blake as as an important figure in your development? I do. I don't think of him a lot, but when I see things, I'm always struck again how how amazing he was. Also, evidently, he sat in his garden with his wife naked in whatever year that was. Not a common thing to do. He wasn't, I mean, they weren't called hippies then, certainly. And if someone came to visit and saw they were standing at the gate and saw that they were naked and they, of course, backed off. And he just said, no, come in. No. <laughs> so he was, uh, well, he was extraordinary. Yeah. And I do know the poetry from since when I was a child, even in England, I knew some of those poems. They were very strong for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how about the, um, the reference to the cave paintings? What do those paintings mean to you? Well, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, people have done wonderful things ever since, but nothing like it, right? And uh, they keep on going back earlier and earlier and earlier. And the kind of observation is so extraordinary. And evidently, they know that they made scaffolds in those caves so that people could reach and paint high up and also must have used children, even if people were smaller, but they used children to go through you know, tiny sort of crevices, holes into like a secondary cave. And they were painting them upside down. Someone was holding their feet in the larger cave. Hmm. And so the whole phenomena of the, of the difficulty, what is understood of the difficulty. I mean, they, first of all, there was no light. It was completely dark, probably bats. Um, and uh, the, the urgency evidently to make these images, narratives, of course, for us, some of the narratives are what accrued from thousands and thousands of years of people painting on top of what was there, right? Other people that they never knew, dead long, long before. But that, yeah, the whole element of time, living in time, yeah. And does the that compression. Help? Does that, does that? That's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> um, and also the compression, I think because your work harkens back to that, it creates uh, almost like a flattening or a telescoping of all time. I mean, there's a, there's a quality of universality in your imagery because you don't show, you don't really depict the specific um, appearance of things so much as you create these kind of, um, I guess, ideograms or, you know, prototypes. Um, that that kind of broad they kind of broaden out. They're more. I think they have more of a poetic impact than a journalistic impact. Can we go to the next image? Yeah, another another swirling <laughs> vortex, a kind of Blakeian figure. This one really brought. The reason I thought of Blake was looking at this image. Actually, hmm. uh, it has this kind of um, this sense of deep void and. Uh, cosmic, a cosmic kind of significance. Would you like to talk about this image? Well, there's the fish that, of course, I talked about in, in, the, in the video. And this painting was vertical for a long time. And just really, absolutely toward the end when I turned it. And sometimes I turn things upside down too. Uh, it seemed stronger to me. And it went through many changes, like everything. But... Uh, yeah, there's, uh, it's, I don't know, fear, possibility, change, change, change. Uh, 
that we tend to live, we refer to the natural world as over there, as if we are not part of it. And, uh, and of course we are, yeah. The um, combination of nature and the plight of humankind, mm. um, probably the two great themes in your work, wouldn't you say? Well, yeah, yeah, it comes up whether I want to or not. And I am struck by that often. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think uh, when I think of working and other people whose work interests me or just people working period, uh, it seems to use oneself fully is really uh, needed needed and wanted and and often very difficult to to get at because uh what's his name wrote that book he referred to a guide to getting over yourself <laughs> and I, it's a phrase i like a lot because um it'd be a good thing to do get over yourself but then use yourself really fully uh which could include very uh, contrasting, varied, uh, could be rage, and, but also tenderness. And uh, maybe tenderness seems difficult now to convey in work. Mm. But I'm glad if it can appear even a little bit. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, even though your work has a strong sort of socio sociological aspect to it, um, you also depict the inner life the life of the mind, I think that's also very strongly present. There's a kind of a, there's a quality of privacy in your work. There's both a public and a private aspect to your work. I think that's one of the things that makes it compelling. Um, I was going to talk about the space in this piece, which uh, really intrigues me because the wave on the lower right, as it emerges and flips over to the upper left is very much in the foreground. And then suddenly you're really shot back that little coil in the lower left. It pulls you back and the figure is suspended beautifully right between the distant and the near view. And I think it's a very artful um, way. And at the same time, without looking deliberate, it looks extremely natural. Well, you're something because you could always talk about work in ways that I wish I could. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Let's yeah. see the next slide. Now, this, these are two pieces, one very recent on the left, which is a photograph. Um, and these photographs, you've been making composites, physical composites, and then shooting them, uh, sometimes using old work. Um, and then on the right, a piece from, this is probably from the 70s, do you think? Probably, yeah. Um, what's intriguing is the you use a similar strategy in both of them, where you have a figure uh, inhabiting a head in a way. And the thing I was thinking about when I saw these was your conception of the figure, not just as a human entity, but also as a place, that the figure is a place. And um, it reminds me of, there's a book by Bachelard called The Poetics of Space. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar Another with it. It's a beauty, yeah. yeah. A beautiful book. And he talks about yeah. the house as a metaphor, but also the head yeah. and the body as a metaphor. And I think your work really um, links in very nicely to that. I have to reread it. I remember him talking about corners, corners in houses, what they, how they pull you in or push you sometimes away. Yeah. Yeah. The psychology yeah. of, of everyday forms, everyday things we, in, we inhabit every day. Take for granted. Yeah. Well, I am very, um, I don't know. Um, geography is very meaningful to me and it's very strange to be my age now and talk to people on you know the phone or email and you have no idea where they are they could be anywhere it's maybe except outer space or maybe that too but but geography is so so powerful and uh i mean it both the physical the landscape like in the uh, democratic convention one of the most moving very moving things was the roll call and to see people real people all different people from different states speaking and see the landscape, the actual landscape behind them, instead of it being in a studio, which it usually would be a convention, right? And mm -hmm. so they made fantastic use, I thought, of the internet. And it was, uh, could make you cry just to see the reality of people trying to live their lives in this time. 
yeah. and uh, and fighting. Yeah. Yeah, the the humbleness of that presentation I found very touching. You know, it wasn't highly produced. It had a real a real quality. Oh, um, it was amazing. Yeah, it was wonderful. So this, it's sort of interesting psychologically here because you have, you could look at this as two people and you, either one of these images as two people or you could look at it as a person and some aspect of their psyche being represented. Did you think of it that way? Well, the truth is, it's not that I don't think before and when I'm working, but sometimes a lot of the thinking or even beginning to try to comprehend what the hell it is I was doing comes after. And uh, so I don't think in the photograph, I was using different stones to form the head. And these are this, this all this blue stu stone that we walk on everywhere here, uh, little bits. And just the idea that a stone, uh, particularly in so many religions, a rock is considered a thing of forever. And actually it's not because of fungus and whatever, aside from wars, uh, stones are always actually um, growing by being upheavaled and also uh, diminishing through fungus and, and growth. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I found this stone that had uh, the image of the woman's head. Actually, it may be a whole body, but you don't see the rest. And uh, yeah, uh, I think things are really just one thing for me, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, another artist that I, I think, we've talked about this before, but um, your relationship to the work of Picasso um, seems very evident. I mean, not just formally, but I think, especially Picasso when he was doing paintings like Guernica and some of his more political things. Um, do you, how do you feel about um, his influence on your work or his influence on 20th century art in general, I guess? Huge. <laughs> I don't know now so much, but it certainly was huge. My mother was a painter and artist and I took her art books to bed with me and mm -hmm. usually a few and certainly I, I, that's how I mainly knew his work, but then I did see uh, Guernica was at the Museum of Modern Art for years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The reason I ask that is because he's sort of considered, um, well, he's like a prototypical macho artist in a way, mm. you know, and, and in fact, probably beyond that, there's some people that, um, some yeah. questions about his deportment vis-a-vis uh, -vis women. And it's, it's interesting to me that you as a female artist um, use some of the vocabulary, but you also bring uh, another a very, uh, to me, a kind of a feminine aspect to these forms that really makes them quite different. Do you, do you think that there's, do you think gender enters into your work? It has to. I mean, mm -hmm. how could it not? I mean, I can't say necessarily in what way, but, but I'm a woman. I've lived a, a girl, a adult, a woman's life. And I'm certainly, of course, influenced by all the changes, which are enormous. They're not enormous enough, but they are enormous of, of how things are, yeah. 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 A work in progress. Um, what? Yeah. Can we see the next image? Um, speaking of stones and rocks, um, <laughs> This, this uh, display was really, uh, I think, a very powerful part of your last show at DC Moore. And um, as an aggregate, I mean, each one of these pieces uh, is you know, lovely. And I, I think they're really um, delicate, they're, they're powerful, they're, you know, each one is, is different. And, but as an aggregate, they really uh, summon up a kind of a sculptural environment. Um, could you talk about what, what led you to this? Uh, well, I think I just started painting on one stone and then over time I keep on, you know, painting more and I still am. And some of them have a painting on the back, which I've forgotten about. And then sometimes I turn it over and realize there's a whole other image on the other side. And then a few of them have um, 
uh, one glued on top of another or the body is in two parts or the body or body animal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it's a form of drawing and it's just, it's drawing on stones. Yeah. And what kind of materials do you use? Oh, ink or acrylic, nothing special. Yeah. Sometimes mm -hmm. just a little bit of color. Sometimes I paste a, a piece of a drawing on, but mostly it's just, just drawing on stones, yeah. And you would say that your work is almost entirely improvisational, wouldn't you? As opposed to? As opposed to planning things out and then executing them, like Sherman's March to the Sea. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's like that. Um, well, I do have plans, but it doesn't seem that I so often am able either to do the plans because too many changes of, of feeling and thought or the world enters in in some way that's often very difficult, but then makes me change things. Mm -hmm. And my own, of course, personal life, yeah. And you, you, all, you seem to find the forms, like your mode of representation I would describe it as metaphorical, like not, you know, you allow distortion, you allow all kinds of things to enter into the work to get to a kind of pure feeling um, rather than a, like a more academic approach where you're drawing volumetrically. Um, and when I was reading this book by Roy Oxlade and he was talking about, it's a book called Art is Instinct. And he was talking about this approach to drawing, which he calls metaphorical, which um, has to do with in, intuition and really finding new ways of representing um, reality. And I think your work exemplifies this perfectly. When I was reading it, I kept thinking of your stuff. Um, when you draw anything, an elephant or a figure, it's, it's always through the filter of your sensibility. And, and, you, and it's not an easy thing to do. A lot of artists can never get there, actually. They're sort of um, depressed in a way by an idea of kind of Renaissance um, verisimilitude. Um, but you have this very direct address um, to your imagery that I think is one of its strongest features. Mm. How do you feel about that idea of image as metaphor? Well, I think it is. <laughs> I mean, maybe not always is, but I mean, just as, as as languages, right? I mean, um, yeah, when, when I read something and just sometimes one sentence, it just, uh, sometimes it attacks me or it attracts me, uh, it, it begins to inhabit me. And, and then usually I guess it's because someone has found, uh, I heard an Irish poet refer to uh, that poetry was language that you couldn't defend yourself against. <laughs> but that's pretty good. Very I'd be good. glad if I could do that with with imagery. Yeah. Mm. In other yeah. words, where, where it opened something up that was not there, or mm. was there but you maybe didn't realize was there. Yeah. And it's always in relation to the work exists, and then what other people's eyes do to it because I think they do something. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> well, there's much more of a, I think your work is much more poetic than prose. You know, it's, it's the narratives um, are, there's a narrative quality, but there, you would agree with this, I think, that there's a narrative quality, but not a, not a, um, a linear story in your work. Well, life doesn't seem one bit linear to me, so I don't know how it could be linear, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, I was thinking in terms of a painting like uh, The Oath of the Horatii by David. That would be, a, to me, a very linear narrative. Uh, uh, or or, liber or yeah. liberty leading the people, you know, that sort of thing. But um, yeah. no. your, your approach is much more, well, it's much more modern, for one thing. Mm. Um, so what do, you, what do you have, to finish this off, I'd like to hear a little about what you're planning to do next. <sighs> um, well, I'm sure as for, 
I would think millions of people doing all kinds of work are uh, trying to believe that doing work is, is, has any meaning at this moment, which seems, feels so, so dangerous and, uh, and frightening. And uh, so I think every day when I'm in the studio, um, I, I can't justify the act of working. That doesn't have any meaning to me. But uh, in some ways it feels more difficult now than certainly than before because of, because of what we're living through. And we don't know anything of what's coming. But the poss many of the possibilities are absolutely terrible. I mean, ter terrifying, yeah. And any way that we can work with other people, and that's why I love doing any kind of collaboration, I think uh, it just strengthens one's own, own feeling. And then of course, because we're not able to be physically close with people the way we were, it's more difficult. And, and that aspect is incredibly sad, particularly for children, but for everyone. So that doesn't tell you what I'm going to do because I don't think I know. I mean, I have ideas, but I don't know. I want to take this moment to thank Mary Frank and David Horning uh, for appearing with us. I also want to thank uh, Rachel Jackson and Judy Kerman, the rest of our crew, our committee, and the Birdcliff staff. And thank you all for viewing this with us today. Thank you. Thank you. And Judy, I think you could stop the recording. <laughs>